All righty. All right, I think we're live on my end as well. Or not really live, but recording anyways. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, we're not live streaming, right? We're just sort of recording this for uh, for later, I guess, or is it uh, going live now? Uh, no, it's not going. What we're go what I'm doing is I'm going to record it first. Then I can mm -hmm. uh, put in some background footage to help make mm -hmm. it more entertaining okay. or things like that. Also, put up pics. It'll make it easier for the audience, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Ah, thank you. Anyways, mm -hmm. uh, so since we're hot now, uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell the audience here about yourself here? Uh, okay. Um, I guess uh, I, I wonder if they're al they already know who I am and they're sick of me, but uh, <laughs> I introduce myself. Uh, I'm uh, Dean Takahashi. I'm the lead writer for GamesBeat at a, a tech news uh, website uh, called VentureBeat. Um, I've been writing tech stories for maybe 30 years or so, and uh, I've had uh, video games as a as a full-time beat, uh, uh, or as a real beat for about 23 years. Um, and I joined Venture Beat about 12 years ago and uh, have been uh, uh, writing a lot of stories uh, about games uh, primarily in that role, but I also cover other kinds of tech uh, like artificial intelligence or things that are happening in Silicon Valley. Um, I also run the GameSpeed conference uh, once a year as well, uh, a, a, a conference about the business of games. Uh, so uh, the primary uh, job that I have is, you know, writing about the business and tech of games. And um, I think, you know, when people uh, hear that I'm a, a game journalist, uh, that that's confused people quite a bit about, or just, you know, the, the assumption to make is that, I review games for a living uh, when, in fact, I maybe do a half dozen of those a year. Um, I do go to a lot more preview events, but as far as just, you know, playing it, playing a game from beginning to end and then reviewing it, uh, that uh, that's a lot less frequent for me. So you would say then, so as you've said, uh, actually reviewing the games is not what you primarily do for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. That, um, that's true. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, I, I think there's, there's sort of a greater number of things that I would, uh, events that I would go to that are preview events and I'd, uh, you know, write about, you know, a slice of a game. Um, but, uh, you know, writing, writing stories about, um, uh, Phoenix Labs uh, being uh, acquired by by Garena, or uh, Electronic Arts earnings, uh, or uh, somebody investing in a new game studio, uh, the amount of uh, revenue being generated by by esports in a year. Um, that's the kind of uh, uh, stories that I'm doing most of the time. All right. So I guess I, if it would be all right with you, I better describe myself a little bit as well. Yeah, I was going to ask that, so uh, <laughs> that, that'd be good to hear. All right, so I'm Ace1918. I wouldn't really mm -hmm. technically call myself a game journalist of if, if any sort myself. I have reviewed a few games in the past. I don't, not on any official publication. I do it on my own, and I do have a channel that I do monetize. Not that I'm making a lot of mm -hmm. money off of it, of course, or anything like that, but mm -hmm. I am personally a massive enthusiast for video games, for preserving video games. Uh, from a historical standpoint, I do believe that video games should be preserved be for generations to come. I think we, I think my personal take on it is we should respect them because and learn from the mistakes from other art forms, such as, for example, film, who, oh, if, nice. if you're familiar with it, um, for example, film, I think in the silent area where you only have something like 11% of all the film from that era actually surviving to this day. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So very unfortunate, I would argue. And I so for that reason, I am big on preserving video game history and video game culture. And I'm also a massive history buff. You could probably tell uh -huh. uh, from a few of the videos I've made, at least. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, there, there's a guy I've, I've met uh, here in Silicon Valley over at Stanford named Henry Lowood. And I remember talking to him uh, a while back. Um, you know, they, they're trying to preserve um, Silicon Valley history and video game history and uh, 
um, uh, online history as well. And he was he was talking to me about how hard it is to do something like um, preserve the history of user generated uh, things in Second Life. Right. <laughs> it's uh, you know, like this is online 3D world. And, um, it, you know, whenever that shuts down or whenever you know somebody stops uh, stops paying or whatever um you know big big uh, parts of that online world are just going to disappear um and um you know his, his his challenge in being an archivist is like you know um he has no idea how you know how how to capture some of that um you know, other, you know, like, what are you going to do? Capture screenshots of it or something, right? Um, it's it's a three D world, and um, and how do, how do you then also show it to people? Like, um, would would this even be possible? So it's it's an interesting subject for sure. So, but th the topic that we're going to have to talk about today is actually with regards to a recent interview that you had with Tasty Loot Gaming. And you were looking uh -huh. to bridge the gap between gamers and game journalists, and you were, uh, you had questions as to why gamers were reacting. A lot of gamers were reacting the way they were with regards to, for example, the recent gameplay footage for Doom Eternal that you had. And yeah. I and I do need to full uh, full disclosure here. I was, of course, the one that I'm sure you're well aware mm -hmm. uploaded the archival footage. I mm -hmm. thought it would be significant potentially, so I wanted to preserve it. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't know that, but uh, good, for, good for you. That's uh, uh, you know, I, I have no quarrel with that. Well, to be honest with you, to I, I do want to answer um, the mm -hmm. the your concern regarding angry gamers uh, with regards to the footage. Mm -hmm. I cannot yeah. speak for everyone, but I can at least speak for myself. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. exclusively because you don't really play games all that well. Mm -hmm. I would argue that it's part of it, but it, it's actually just, a, like I said, a part of a much bigger problem. And the bigger problem, in my opinion, could essentially be, and this isn't for you, just for you. This is actually a problem, I would argue, is in a issue within the industry of game journalism itself these days, mm -hmm. is there seems to be an issue of unwarranted authority what people would presume as unwarranted authority but it's like i said the gameplay itself is just one piece of a much bigger problem there and i mm -hmm. could actually and i think the reason why people go after you is because mm -hmm. the gameplay is the most obvious example mm -hmm. but there are in my opinion i would actually argue that um when it comes to for example writing articles i've seen a, f a few that i don't necessarily agree with that you've made but mm -hmm. and i could go into them if you want to in mm -hmm. fact i've intended to, mm -hmm. but there mm -hmm. are definitely far worse uh, in terms of writing articles, far worse journalists out there. And mm -hmm. like I said, there's a lot of problems. And if you want, I, I could list them all out for you. We can discuss them piece by piece if you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, why don't we take it in small chunks? And so, uh, you know, you can bring something up and maybe I can I can talk about it. And, uh, I, you know, I'm fine with that. Um, I, like I said, I've got a, I've got a thick skin, been at this for a long time. And so I'm happy to have a conversation, and uh, and this would not, uh, you know, I would not consider this to be you know, an inappropriate topic at all. I, I think it's fine for you to bring up whatever you're concerned about. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's see the first one. Where would I start with? Well, on the issue of uh, let's see, uh, so on the issue, let's uh, talk about, for example. The issue of, well, how some game journalists actually treat gamers or seem to portray gamers in some of their articles. Uh, so I've got, for example, uh, let, a good article would be, for example, let's actually get a file here for you. Hey, you know, your audio is kind of cutting on me. It's, it's It seems like it's pausing or, or stuttering a bit, uh, so... Um, oh yeah, I've got it you, you, on. Uh, I've got press to talk. I'm sorry on that. Okay, <laughs> right. Yeah, you, I, there were a couple of gaps there. I think. Hmm. All right. So I've just sent you a a pic from one of the articles I would be talking about here, and the way that um, some game journalists seem to portray gamers. 
So this article here, it's about, it's about, uh, it's about the suggestion, right? That it's about the backlash regarding Battlefield uh, Five. Uh, how familiar are you with it, that, by the way? Uh, yeah, um, uh, about the uh, sort of the diversity side of it, uh, and whether or not uh, made sense to put a female on on the cover, and all, all the other things related to that. Well, I would argue it was main. It was had to do with uh, the fact that Dice was marketing it as a historically accurate game, like they had Trevor Noah during the live stream event say something along the lines of talking about Battlefield One in relation that he was telling his a kid relative of his that he could defend playing the game by telling his mom that it was a history lesson. So uh -huh. using that standard in your marketing while at the same time showing uh -huh. stuff that was obviously historically inaccurate. And I actually, by the way, that was something that got me a lot of subscribers uh, when I covered this because I did a few videos that really blew up. Uh, two videos got 80,000 views each on it because a lot of people agreed with what I said and uh, the point of view that I had at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, the real reason I bring up this particular article is this is one of the paragraphs that's presented in the article here. And let's see if I can find it here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the article uh, or the paragraph I'm talking about starts with, but the hate that drove so much of the atrocities of World War II is still here, and in bitter irony, the reaction to the game depicting has it, it has shown that it still lingers as much today as it did back then. It's a beast in hibernation towards what may be an inevitable and unstoppable awakening. So, mm -hmm. the problem I have with this particular article, and with a lot of articles that seem to throw this particular angle, Mm -hmm. It basically is trying to portray gamers for having this backlash towards Battlefield Five as being uh, right-wing extremists. Mm -hmm. I mean, the game, they're literally comparing the atrocities of World War II in this case, or the attitudes that drove them to gamers not liking Battlefield Five. Uh -huh. Yeah. You would agree with uh, that that is a reasonable interpretation of that, correct? Uh, I'm I'm trying to look at the exact par which paragraph uh, in in here is. It's the, one the uh, sixth paragraph of the picture, sir. Okay, yeah, yeah. It seems like a, a definite ed editorial comment, right? Uh, an opinion as opposed to any kind of um, uh, fact. Um, so. Um, uh, is this concern about, uh, you know, opinion creeping into, uh, I guess, what attempts to be like a, a, a journalistic story, like it's supposed to be a fair story? Or, well, like uh, I said, the issue here is the journalist in question with this article is essentially making the argument that gamers mm -hmm. as a culture are right wing or that they and that they are have very similar opinions to the fascists of World War Two because mm -hmm. of them disagreeing with Battlefield 1. That's essentially what the yeah. paragraph there is arguing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, I think uh, it feels like a, a stereotype about gamers and that, um, you know, uh, when, uh, when we have uh, contentious things happen, like, say, say Gamergate, uh, then uh, that's when you would see people use this kind of... Um, uh, sort of uh, uh, just unfair characterization of all gamers as uh, as sort of primitive uh, heathens, I guess, uh, um, and that uh, uh, you know, I, I would think that it, that is no more correct uh, than uh, you know than anything. I mean, if you look at uh, the the demographics of gaming, with the average age being thirty three and 46% are female, and um, the diversity of content that gamers like. I mean, uh, you can't... Uh, sorry, you cut out there for a second. Uh, would you continue? You would, you know, uh, try to group gamers together. Um, I, I think people, people um, resort to this when they're writing something in a, in a bit of a sloppy way. Uh, and so... 
uh, I think your perception that this happens all the time, maybe, um, you know, that, uh, that you can really feel that, right? Well, I, I see articles like this a lot, and I have to cover them a lot. For example, I've actually just uploaded another picture, this one from The Guardian. Actually, it's a journalist I that you've actually uh, cited yourself in one of your articles as well, I was actually looking at. Although her, it's a different article that she created, but this is a, it's the same author, Alpha mm-hmm. Brown, Alfie Brown here. And it's talking about how she argues that mm-hmm. video games are fueling the rise of the far right. Mm-hmm. And it, it, so, yeah, yeah, and some of the games I can actually go ahead and bring up. A yeah, that, that, from that, that doesn't look like a very good headline to me. <laughs> um, I absolutely but, uh, agree with you. <laughs> that, uh uh, and I, I, yeah, but did you have a question for, for me related to that, I guess? Or... Well, I think, uh, well, what I was getting at, though, the whole point is yeah. you wanted to uh, you wanted to ask what it, exactly it was, or you want to know what it would take to bridge the gap between gamers and game journalists. And I think one of the first major issues is yeah. the depiction of gamers by many game journalists out there who seem to think that gamers are the next Hitler, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 and um, yeah, it would it it is not good for people to hate, and it would not be good for game journalists to hate gamers. Um, I I I would not condone that, and uh, um, I think uh, it's it's also um, poor form for for anybody to stereotype somebody. Um, and uh, and yeah, God knows that gamers have had to live with stereotypes their entire lives, right? Uh, uh, you know, I, I grew up as a gamer. Uh, I was also kind of nerdy, and so then uh, you know, I can feel it when people um, make fun of uh, of gamers as being a certain type of person. So um, so yeah, uh, I, I think. Um, is is there a divide that is uh i I think the divide is there uh that uh, journalists as a whole have not uh treated uh the game industry or gamers um as um as equals right uh and uh and they've uh taken far too many opportunities to look down on uh these people um but you know, I, I guess I have a more complicated sort of uh, uh, view of this uh, because uh, I'm a uh, I'm a gamer and I, I'm a game journalist. Uh, I'm, I'm both of these things, and um, do do I uh, see this happening more or less? I, I see a lot of uh, contention and divisiveness for sure, um, and uh, you know, I, I think. Um, uh, are, are, are you know a lot of things you can see just visibly on on places like Twitter, right? That uh, people argue with each other all the time, or even like say on Metacritic, if you you can see the score that um, uh, the game journalist gave uh, to uh, to a game on on one side, and then on the other side you see the score that gamers um, have rated uh, the game, and um, you know there's a lot of cases where there's just no agreement there as well. And, um, and so, yeah, I think there's, there's lots of reason to believe that there's a divide uh, between, between gamers and game journalists. I mean, there is, you know, I, I don't know anybody who would doubt that. Right. I mean, I do, com- I actually completely agree with you on that point. There is a divide. Now I also, by the way, just, although kind of irrelevant now at this point, but I did also, uh, Put up, put up the uh, specific paragraph that I took a special issue with uh, from the article here, where they they cite games, right, like, uh, f- as having right-wing talking points, and some of the games include Mario and Zelda for Princess Recovery as a right-wing talking point, but as you've, uh, but like I've said, uh, with what you've said right there, I think it's kind of made that a bit there rather irrelevant, uh, or because you've kind of already said, yes, this is pretty bad. Now, I actually saw an article uh, made by you, and well, there was uh-huh. a couple articles I've considered in the past covering, right? So, for example, I know that Tasty Loot Gaming d- uh, discussed with you a little bit about your Call of Duty article. Uh-huh. My personal opinion, and this seems to happen quite a few times where I'll see an article from you, and I don't necessarily agree with it. I do think it might, I might, act, I don't, I might disagree with it pretty badly, but 
there are far worse articles out there on the exact same subject, mm -hmm. and they seem to get as much attention as well. So, for example, while I didn't really cover your uh, discussions on the Call of Duty stuff, I ended up instead covering uh, the statements made by John Phipps, uh, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with who that is. I don't, I don't remember offhand, though. I probably need more context there. Well, I guess we can talk about that a little bit later, but the article I was going to discuss with you that you had written, I'm going to mm -hmm. actually try to get it. There we go. Yeah, I, I think you got a push-to-talk problem again. I, I, you, you went out. Yeah, sorry, I had to get the uh, link here. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But yes, you argued in this article of whether or not politics would make video games better. Now, you'd also mm -hmm. describe yourself in this exact same article as a social justice warrior. Mm -hmm. um, if right. you want, I can point you to the area specifically. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm going to look up the article as well here and make it easier for me to read. Um, all right. All right, so the, art, the uh, paragraph I'm citing as you saying that you're describing yourself as a social justice warrior actually is, around, is close to the bottom. It's the two, three, fourth from the bottom. Now, the entire paragraph, it says, I acknowledge that the main object is to make games fun, and I don't hate video games that are made just to be fun, but I put myself in the camp of social justice warriors. Let those game developers who want to do so express their political views in a transparent way, even if their bosses want to shut them up. I sincerely wish that crazy politics of Donald Trump would inspire someone to create a beautiful metaphorical treatment that gives us all some clarity about what all of this means. Now, my question to you, uh, from this paragraph, you do describe yourself as a social justice lawyer. Uh -huh. My question to you is, your interpretation, do you believe that all games are inherently political? Uh... I, I guess I don't understand what that really means um, and where that's where that's really going. So um, could you sure could I you can elaborate follow, follow up uh, with that? Yeah, sure. OK, so the reason I ask this is uh, the ideology of social justice, as it were, pretty much demands that all games be viewed through a political lens. I can actually provide you the academic uh, scholarly work, the college textbook that presents this exact specific argument and is the essentially the genesis of this specific argument within relations to video games, if you want to, because I've actually got it up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a book. It's called Games of Empire. And I'll actually go ahead and get the link for you to download the PDF if you want. But uh -huh. the whole yeah. point of the... Uh, but to summarize it for you, um, the whole point of the book is that it argues... This book, by the way, came out 2009, 2010, that time span that mm -hmm. it argues that all games are inherently political, that the industry itself is inherently pushing a right-wing ideology, mm -hmm. and it ultimately tries to argue for various ways for the industry to push left-wing politics instead. That is the core point of the entire book. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, it sounds interesting, but also very academic, I guess. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, well, that's because but, uh, it is, but I, I think it is one of those uh, core works that you do need to read to fully understand social justice as an ideology. Mm -hmm. Anyways, this should provide a link to the PDF, and uh, that mm -hmm. should now it is like I said, the book is three hundred some pages, so it's extremely long. But I do want to provide you a good example of just how extreme mm -hmm. the professors that wrote this book actually are. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so I've got another picture, and it's a bit from the... Well, I mean, if you want to just go back to that column, uh, I have it up in front of me. And is, is there just a specific question on, on that column and what I wrote that you have? Well, I, what I think it is, and what I'm, what the argument I'm trying to make here is that I don't think you fully understand the ideology uh, behind social justice because it, like I said, argues that all games be viewed as political. To the extent that mm -hmm. we've got uh, game journalists like, for example, Ben Kuchera arguing that mm -hmm. Tetris was actually Soviet, pro-Soviet propaganda 
And I can actually provide you the tweets if you want to right now of him saying this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that doesn't sound correct to me. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, uh, that sounds like something uh, somebody would write, uh, uh, you know, working on a college paper or something like that. Um, All right, so here you go. And, yeah, this is the guy. He's making the argument, like I've said, that the game is pro-Soviet propaganda and that it's pushing a very specific political theme. Now, as you've said, it's... It sounds like nonsense. That I would argue because it is. Yeah, I don't buy that one. But the problem is, it, with the ideology of social justice, you're not actually allowed to disagree with that. You see, the I, the reason is because the whole point of that particular movement, you have to argue that everything is political and try to push a political narrative at all times, because otherwise the whole point of the movement kind of falls by the wayside. You, the reason why they make the argument, for example, that uh, Battlefield Five has to be diverse and that gamers are bigots for disagreeing is because they believe that that, make, that uh, making your game diverse is it is and of itself a political statement, and that disagreeing with that, even if for historical accuracy or things like that, mm-hmm. particularly potentially valid reasons, I would argue, then that makes you a bad person for doing so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you disagree with my interpretation of that? Um, yeah, I'm kind of, you know, my, my head is, uh, is sort of, uh, kind of filling up with the, uh, the information here still. And so, uh, I'm, I, I can't really say whether I agree or disagree. I, I do think that, um, maybe what I'm talking, talking about here, as far as, um, uh, social justice, goes is is that i i do care about justice in society i mean um i'm not actually um uh you know aligned with um, some particular ideology i think re- related to this um uh and so maybe i'm just simply misinterpreting what a social justice warrior means you know uh i think i think you think it means something very specific um from your point of view, right? And um, uh, I, I don't actually um, think that uh, I have gone and done that research to figure out um, whether or not, um, you know, I'm, I'm an actual social justice warrior. Uh, so so I, I, I think that what, um, what I um, do is, is I, you know, gather lots of facts, uh, collect them, uh, synthesize them, and I think about it, and I, I just sort of like to think about what's the right thing here, and and then I form an opinion, and uh, and that um, can be seen um, fairly transparently in my writing. Um, and so, what you often see me doing is, you know, I, I collect information on something, I write news stories, uh, but at some point I write a column like this one uh, about uh, a politics and games, which is a which is actually more like an editorial. It's an opinion piece, right? And um, and so if it has the tag the Dean Beat on it, uh, that that's what that means is that this is my opinion column, um, and uh, uh, in that. In that sense, I'm not um, afraid to bring up topics of social justice and say what my opinion is about them. So I think that's 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 maybe what I mean by being a social justice warrior. And maybe you think that might be um, a little too vague. I guess I don't know. Well, to be honest, I did when I read the article. I and from what I extrapolated from it, I don't actually think you are a genuine SJW. That's, I think, mm-hmm. as you've mentioned, yet you don't fully understand what it was. That is my f- personal honest opinion on this. Now, I uh-huh. mentioned I don't agree with the point of the article, but I will have to say this to your credit. There is something I do have to say to your credit here. Your argument here is built upon the foundation that you believe that me- putting the politics in the game would make it better. I have mm-hmm. to... I, have, I bring this up because you're the first game journalists of any sort that I've actually seen make the argument that it would make it better. Now, the mm-hmm. reason I bring this up is because the idea of forced politics 
at its core is not necessarily to make the games better. It's actually to push the agenda and the game is treated as secondary. Now, mm -hmm. I've mentioned I don't agree with the, argu the base argument of the article. Allow me to explain why right here. The reason is because your, arg your argument uh, is that by putting politics in the game, it would make it more like it would make it more respected, like an art form. Mm -hmm. My argument, my counter to this is that it's the whole point of art is multiple interpretations. That's one of the main cornerstones of it. The whole point of propaganda or making things highly politicized to push an agenda is to make the interpretations as few as possible. You want one specific interpretation to push your narrative. So mm -hmm. what I'm saying here basically is that trying to politicize games is essentially at best bad art and at worst the death of art is what I would argue is how I would counter it. Mm -hmm. So I don't agree with the uh, with the statement that you make here, but like I've said before, to your credit, you are the first person that seems to actually be interested in making games better, at least as far as the game journalist community when it comes to the discussion of politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um... Uh, it, it, to, to help me understand better, I, I, I have a question then. So, like, uh, if you, if you look at uh, Arthur Miller's um, play, The Crucible, right, and he he writes it in the 1950s during the McCarthy era, um, and uh, you know, it's it's a look back at Salem, Massachusetts, uh, but uh, the fact that it comes out uh, during the 1950s during the the witch hunts for for communists uh to me uh made it an extraordinary sort of uh piece of literature right um and that you know something that had meaning beyond uh just what the uh events of the of the play the book uh you know chronicle right and um uh you know why why not do something like that for uh for video games um you know wh uh, why um why would somebody uh say not create a game about what they think about the the political time we're in now and and do something uh similar that sort of captures uh the uh the feel of the times uh in an accurate way uh, that you can see only because uh, there's sort of this uh, this is a metaphorical layer here right so so I think um, you know that's that's what I, I think would be a very interesting do you think that something like um, uh, the crucible is um, is, uh, is 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 a good use of politics in in art well, uh, the question would be if it's open to multiple interpretations. Now, I haven't actually read or, the script behind The Crucible or seen it or anything uh -huh. like that, I, so I can't really comment on that. But I can have an example in film that I have seen recently is Joker. Now, a lot of people have said a lot of good things about Joker, and I'm one of them. Uh -huh. Um, uh -huh. I think that even though you can make the argument that Joker does ha have an opinion on quite a few things, that it is still very much open to interpretation. It's not actual propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, some people make the argument that the reason that Joker, uh, that Arthur Fleck turns out the way he did is because he was denied the medication. Some people think that it was all made up in his head from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I've made the argument on one of my videos that you could actually say that the hyper-politicization of everything within the society of Gotham helped create the environment that created Joker in its own right, because mm -hmm. e everything got politicized to the extent that uh, Mr. Murray mm -hmm. uh, or Mr. Franklin on the Murray Franklin show ended up as uh, asking Joker three times mm -hmm. if he was donned in his outfit for making a political statement. The, mm -hmm. That's the very first thing that they assumed by seeing him in a clown outfit. Not that he could potentially have just been a clown as a day job or anything like that. Mm -hmm. but, but anyways, the point I'm getting at is, there are. Mm -hmm. can you have uh, political messages in games? It, I do think it is possible to an extent. And if mm -hmm. a person wishes to do it with a brand new IP, I don't see an issue with it. The mm -hmm. problem is, and I, this is what I've been getting to, is that a lot of game journalists and the social justice community very specifically demand that all games be viewed as political. It's... Mm -hmm. 
meaning that there is zero tolerance for an apolitical video game. To it's um, and that, for example, I, I, as I brought up the whole uh, thing that they view diversity as a political statement in its own right. A good example of a game that actually got absolutely harassed by game journalists is a game called uh, Kingdom Come Deliverance. Uh -huh. Now, this game, they were doing this. They were slandering the uh, guy that created this game since January of 2014. The game came out in 2018. So they were doing this four years leading up to the, the time that the game actually came out. And the reason why they did this was because the game is set in a very specific rural area of Bohemia. And it's, it's an area that is still very rural and underdeveloped to this day. There's only maybe a few thousand people living there total. And they were, they were complaining that there were not enough people of color in medieval Bohemia in the year of 1403 when the game is set. Mm -hmm. Now... And because of this, they decided to call the guy a racist. They decided to try to boycott the game. They decided to spend years of their time writing hit pieces against him, all because he wanted to make his game historically accurate. And in the setting of 1403 Bohemia, in the rural part of it, the simple truth was there were no black people in Bohemia, in that part of Bohemia at that time. Mm -hmm. And that's something that was his position. So I think that's the big problem that everyone has, and that is another big issue with the whole politicization of everything, is that it's gotten to such an extreme that it's become absolutely intolerable in its own right. Mm -hmm. In fact, allow me to bring you uh, bring it up some of the. I mean, I, I think that that you put your finger on what I would call a very hard um, problem, right? A hard question, right? And um, you know that that particular um, uh, demand that uh, that you put people of color into Kingdom Come Del Deliverance uh, is really a um, you know a demand to, to change that history, right, and to make it inaccurate and to um, and uh, uh, and I, you know I I, I think um, you know the developer makes that stand if. Uh, if that's what they've done, um, if they have not toyed around with any history um, at all, uh, uh, then then yeah, they can they can sort of plant that uh, that sort of line or you know draw that line in the sand and, and say, look, I'm I'm not going to change this uh, because this is historically accurate. Um, you know the. The interesting thing that I, I guess comes up is um, is when some of the the facts are blurry, or you know, um, there, there are other facts that are sort of lesser known. Um, so if if you shoot back over to Battlefield and uh, and World War II, uh, and you know there there were women in the French resistance that were fighting, or there were um, you know, black Africans who were fighting uh, for the French um, that you didn't know about or hear about. And, um, and uh, uh, you know, they, they actually say in that uh, scene in, in Battlefield that, uh, you know, we were, we were sort of written out of the history books um, because we were not the ones that wrote, wrote them, right? And, and th th this is where I think, you know, um, we can have more... Uh, we could have very interesting arguments about what's the right thing to do in in this case. I mean, well, um, Battlefield's conceit is that they're going to show you, they're going to show you scenes and parts of history that you have not seen before, right? Now, uh, you know, if I if I were a World War II scholar, I would probably be able to fairly quickly figure out whether they're telling the truth on that or not, right? But, well, um, uh, if, but some of this sounded like they had done their research and their homework um, on the battlefield side to actually justify, you know, say, putting a woman on a cover or putting black people in French uniforms, uh, that sort of thing. Well, what I'm getting at, I, I, I think most people do realize that the, the Senegalese, uh, which are the which were the African troops that served in the French units. By the way, for in case you're curious, 
I actually have worked on a mod called Battlefield 1918 for the original Battlefield 1942, and we actually uh -huh. it's it's set in World War One, but we do actually have the Senegalese in there, as well as the Ascari that served in the German Empire at the time, and the Schutztruppe, which were well, the Schutztruppe are technically part of the or the Ascari were technically part of the Schutztruppe historically speaking, but as faction wise, it's a, the Schutztruppe themselves are German colonists in German Africa, but. The thing is, it's not. It wasn't that people were complaining about the game, including French Senegal or members of the French Resistance, because there were women in the French Resistance. I have uh, in my video talking about this. I actually point this out. I point out, of course, also that there were members that were there were women in the Russian Eastern Front, which yeah. is the thing that a lot of journalists will point to. The problem is there were no women that with that were amputees serving in the British infantry, which is what the trailer depicts and is which is what the cover art shows. Mm -hmm. There were no women amputees in the British infantry at the time. That's Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a bad. <laughs> exactly. And that's what they decided to showcase in the tr in their historically yeah. accurate game that's supposed to be viewed as a educational history tool at least how they marketed it but the thing especially is especially with prosthetics that were actually so functional uh, back during those days as well right <laughs> uh, she she had a badass prosthetic on her i mean it's i've actually seen his uh, historical footage from world war one from the perspective uh, with regards to prosthetics there's it doesn't actually look that different in that regard, but like I said, but oh, by the way, since you mentioned uh, Kingdom Come Deliverance and you were t uh, concerned about the historical accuracy there, the yeah. game is actually, uh, I should mention, is so historically accurate that I actually had to do a video on this, that the University of Prague, which is in the Czech Republic, uh, yeah. where Bohemia historically existed, decided to use it as an educational tool for its college students with regards to how things were in the medieval times. It is that legitimately historically accurate. And I can tell you other things as well. Yeah. Like now, um, now here, you know, you know your history here, right? And um, what, I like to what, think I do. What, what I think we, we have in this divide here, I think what what uh, could very logically and, and should happen is that, you know, I, I get my interview with uh, the the dice uh, developers um, and uh, you know I, I get I get an interview say with the creative director um, and then he pulls along his his researcher um, and you know we sit down and then I I pull in someone like you and then we have a discussion right and <laughs> that that would be uh, to me that would be interesting journalism right um, if 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 you only have uh, one of each of these parts, uh, then, you know, it's quite possible that we start all talking past each other, right? Um, and, uh, but, but wouldn't it be wonderful if um, we had the creative director, we had uh, the historian uh, for, for DICE, uh, we had me, we had you in a conversation and saying, like, what gives, you know, <laughs> uh, tell, you, you, you know what, uh, tell us what, what is accurate here. And what you changed in order to uh, achieve a particular purpose, like you know, was it was it something you changed to make it more fun, uh, or was it something you you know changed uh, for another reason, you know, to to show your respect for diversity? Um, uh, uh, I do remember when I asked these questions of the dice people about Battlefield Five. Um, you know, they they would always say that fun trumps history. Right, fun, fun, is what we tried to find, um, and uh, and so I think that, that there is a there is a, a very interesting conflict there because what we what we have here is um, entertainment, right? And it's uh, it's uh, not pure history, and um, uh, it's it's a very interesting subject and discussion that I've I've brought up a number of times with developers um but uh, but yeah it, it always feels like um you know i'm i'm missing some of this um uh, historical precision um knowledge uh and and they are as well and um uh you know it, it sort of results in a kind of a muddy conversation i i'm actually glad you brought that up the the fact that dice uh, tried to make the argument that they value fun over authenticity because 
that was actually one of the things I talked about in one of my videos that really did blew up uh, back in the day, where basically I actually took the argument to the extreme and actually demonstrated another game set in World War II. The game, by the way, is called Dino D-Day, if you've ever heard of it. The basic premise of the game is essentially it's World War II, but with dinosaurs. The idea is that the game is meant to be fun, but what was amusing was I the video the whole point of the video I actually demonstrated that the act that that particular game because it did actually try to have the aesthetic right and everything a lot of things right despite the fact that it was a game about World War II with dinosaurs it actually ended up looking playing and feeling more like a proper World War II game than Battlefield 5 did that was the whole point of that video and it did actually take <laughs> off uh -huh. That sounds kind of funny. Yeah. If you want, I can actually provide you the link so you can actually see it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I take a look. Hello, everyone. All right, this is the video here for you. Now, I'll go ahead and let you watch it later, but, yeah, the point I was getting at, uh, that was another issue, though, was the hyper-politicization of everything within the game industry. I think that is another big issue that a lot of gamers take with a lot of game journalists these days. Because when gamers voice their concerns about Battlefield Five and the historical inaccuracies within it, they were willing to see women, for example, as Russian soldiers, or as members of the French, Re French Resistance. I actually pointed mm -hmm. this out in one of my other videos on the topic. But gamer, but the game journalist community still seemed to want to portray it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, but the game journalist community still wanted to portray it as gamers are sexist towards women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so like I said, that is another issue. And the, then there's another one I should bring up, which is articles that really one has to wonder what on earth the particular journalist was thinking when they wrote them. And let me pr look up a good example here for you. Uh, where is it? So yeah, the pick in, in question here is an actual article from Vice here by, by a journalist by the name of Jed Whitaker. And would you be kind enough to read the title of the article for the audience here? Yeah. Nintendo's Switch Joy-Con sync issue is even worth, worse if you put it in your butt. <laughs> All right. So yeah, this is an actual article with that actually did go across an editor's desk. And... I, I kid you not, this is 100% a real article, but the point I'm bringing up here by this is you see articles like this also on occasion, and you have to wonder just what on earth that particular journalist was thinking when they decided to write it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you, what do you think here? Um... I think it's rather embarrassing, to be honest. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, now, Vice and Motherboard, though they don't they don't strike the Motherboard more so, but Vice, uh, yeah, <sighs> mm. <laughs> not the finest journalism all the time, right? But yeah, let's like I said, stuff like that. Now, as far as the actual ability to play games, if you ask me, I do have to be honest. Uh, I do have to be honest. I do think that. There does need to be efforts to improve uh, skill to an extent. I do believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason, mm -hmm. part of the reason is, I do think it can have a negative effect, especially on games with niche appeal. And on that subject, you've mentioned uh, your belief that 
It, you mentioned this in your interview with Tasty Loot Gaming, your belief that accessibility is the future of video games. Mm -hmm. uh, would you be happy to elaborate on that? Uh, yeah. Um, so that was in the context of talking to a, a Microsoft exec. Uh, we, we ran that story this morning, uh, a fellow named James Gortzman. And, uh, uh, you know, he said, we, we talk all the time about how the fact that there are 2.8 mil billion gamers uh, or people who have played games in the world. Uh, and wouldn't it be wonderful if we could, ex you know, reach those people? Um, more regularly or expand that right um, to the point where everybody's playing games and um, and so uh, so I, I think my argument is yes that is a good market for them to go after um, and you know there are less than a hundred million Xbox owners out there and um, you know Microsoft uh, uh, has this you know sort of strategic um, decision to make about like who, who do we make happy and who do we go after um, uh, my, my argument is that you can go after both of them right uh, and that uh, 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 one helps the other and so if, if they um, create games that have mass appeal um, you know they uh, they don't have to make uh, every single game oriented towards uh, the 2.8 billion people. Um, but uh, say say they make a successful game uh, that does well and it reaches 2.8 billion people, um, you know, mo more likely it's a mobile game of some kind with uh, free-to-play uh, and uh, microtransactions in it. Um, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and that creates um, billions of dollars of revenue coming into the company. Um, you know, you, you can take that money and expand your budget for AAA and uh, focus on making a game for those uh, 100 million players. Um, and and you, you become more successful, right? Uh, so uh, when you're more successful, you have a game industry that looks like it does in 2019 as opposed to how the game industry looked in, say, 1982, right? Um, uh, you, you didn't, you had, um, uh, you had underfunded, sort of underpowered technology and underfunded games in the earlier days of gaming. Um, but if, if you sort of free up this money, um, you can benefit, you can, you can reap a lot of rewards from targeting billions of people and you can benefit the hardcore gamers. And so, um, to me, that's, that's a formula for success. And, uh, and the problem I had was if, um, you know, uh, gamers might see that as a betrayal and say, oh, they're leaving us behind, you know, we the hundred million, um, we're the reason that this Xbox exists in the first place and yet uh, they're not making games for us anymore. Um, you know, that, uh, that, that would be an attitude, I think, that would be counterproductive to uh, what gamers want, which is better games. Well, I think, in my opinion, I would actually, I do actually disagree with the argument that uh, accessibility is inherently the future of gaming. I think accessibility actually has has had some very real issues for the industry. And my thinking of the, and my reasoning is, uh, with regards to the core gaming, like for what you see with on the Xbox and the PlayStation and whatnot, there's been an issue where we've had such an effort to try to make games as accessible as possible that it kind of curtails the thing, that it kind of flies in the face in some respects to make, the, make them stand out. Um, it's been bad enough that we've had examples, like uh, there's a game journalist by the name of Jim Sterling who's reported cases where he would go to a convention play a game and then realize midway through while playing that he's actually playing a different game than he thought he was because they all seem to play and run the same in with regards to their specific genres. The big problem here is that when you do that and you do that continuously for years on end, it kind of gets a little bit stale. You kind of take away the things that made the games themselves individually interesting and it makes the it makes these games less fun overall because of the sheer effort to make them as accessible as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually seen this act, uh, done very, and part of the reason I argue this, first of all, we do have examples of where the biggest games out there, the most recent successes with paid games specifically, 
tend to come from indie gamers, from indie markets, where they actually, the game itself would not be considered accessible to the AAA. A great example would be Minecraft. Minecraft would not be considered an accessible game by the standards of the AAA market. Yet it is to date at of around 180 million sales, it's the most popular game of all time, at least as far as sold games. I think the reason is because what gamers actually want is variety. They want different kind of genres, they want to be able to play games different types of ways, and they're just not getting that from the AAA. I myself, I don't actually um, usually get all that hyped anymore these days about AAA games. I usually mainly get interested. Yeah, I, you know, I gotta, I gotta dispute that. I think AAA is is really, really strong right now, um, and um, uh, in, in some ways, never, never better. Um, I, I, I have, I have no trouble coming up with my top ten games of the year every year and a lot of them are a lot of them are triple a games I'm, I'm not putting many vr games on my list i'm not putting many mobile games on my list or any maybe um the best games of the year to me um that are coming out a lot of them are triple a well there are still some good triple a games and actually i would argue that things are getting better as well the mm -hmm. really bad period of when these games were getting exceedingly derivative and it was damaging the industry was really from, I would argue, 20, 2009 to 2014. And mm -hmm. I would argue that Gamergate kind of helped change that by showing the executives that there was a disconnect between the game journalists and the gamers. And mm -hmm. when they I saw this... That was also a disconnect between game companies and, and gamers as well. Mm -hmm. I agree, because yeah. the game companies at the time, they saw the game journalists as, being, as speaking for everyone, and when it turned out that that was clearly not the case, they decided... They were put at a crossroads of whether or not they want to side with the game. Well, you're, you you've been precise before, but you're you're making a generalization now. <laughs> uh, this is my uh, this is my uh, hypothesis or theory, yeah. if you will, on the situation. This is my take on it. Sure, yeah. and I I do have to point out that there have been definitely cases where games were meant were made to be more accessible, and the franchise suffered as a direct result of it. Uh, the one I would provide for you most recognizably would be Ninja Gaiden 3, which mm -hmm. in the developer's attempt to make the game more accessible, they toned down the difficulty uh, to try to make it easier, more appealable to everyone, and it ended up just collapsing on its own. The game flopped for the exact reasons that they tried to make it more accessible. Uh, mm -hmm. Another good example, one of the more most infamous ones, an older example that you might be familiar with, would be Ultima 9. This was around 2009 or 1999 when this game came out, but they dumbed down the story to make it so that people that were ne that had never played an Ultima game could get into it, uh -huh. and it was easily one of the it was easily the worst game of the entire franchise. It killed the franchise, and to put it to perspective, if you look at Ultima Zero or uh -huh. Aclabeth, I think the game's called. Yeah. That game came out in 1979. So it was a if you include that, that was a yeah. franchise running for 20 years that was mm -hmm. killed by accessibility. Yeah. Well, definitely um I have heard about that from Richard uh, Garriott himself. <laughs> and he would not argue with that um uh with you and um he, uh, he remembered quite well we did um we did a fireside chat together once and uh, uh he remembered how he was getting very junior um, uh, electronic arts um, managers uh, put in charge of him uh, in his last um, last days at uh, uh, at electronic arts and origin and um, and you know with precisely these kinds of problems um, that uh, you know they they would you know they would switch the manager every six months or something like that and um, uh, he would have a new boss, and uh, you know they they would uh, you know have their own opinions about how to, how to make things better, and and that to me was totally a dysfunctional environment at Electronic Art, right? I mean, you can you can pinpoint that to um, why would you do that? Why would you buy a company uh, created by one of the the pioneers of gaming and uh, run it into the like that? Um, you know. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's why we don't have Ultima again. I, exactly my point. And it's, the problem is I've actually seen the argument for accessibility 
kind of drive, I would argue, drive uh, major publishers away from certain genres as well, even. Uh, yeah. There's a reason. I, I, don't think, I don't think the accessibility may have been the demand that brought down Ultima. I think it was purely um, astonishingly bad management of, uh, of a uh, creative professional. I do believe that the astonishingly bad man management was certainly a part of it, but I also do think that the disregard for the two decades worth of lore had a lot to do with alienating the player base. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, you, you can actually talk to content creators like Spoonie. Back, Spoonie did mm -hmm. an entire series of reviews on the games. This was back when Spoonie mm -hmm. was still, back before he had uh, dishonored himself, essentially, uh, within the eyes of the public. And he mm -hmm. did actually do a pretty good review of Ultima 9, in my opinion, and explained mm -hmm. exactly what was wrong with the game. But... Mm -hmm. I would also argue that this also affects niche genres as well. There seems to be, for example, there's been a lack of flight sims uh, mm -hmm. for a long time now. And this is not because the flight sim genre wasn't really viable. I mean, Microsoft 10 was... Oh, yeah, I, lo I love fl flight sims. That used to be my thing. Exactly. Microsoft 10, massive commercial success. The mm -hmm. entire genre then disappears off the face of the earth. In fact, it was actually going disappearing even at that point. And I would argue part of the reason is because you can't really make a flight sim what would be considered accessible by the standards of the AAA publishers. Mm -hmm. There's a limit to how accessible you can make it. And another mm -hmm. genre that really suffered because of this is the wargaming genre, which you've mentioned mm -hmm. in your interview with games yeah. like Panzer General. Or, yeah. I mean, technically it doesn't count, but Steel Division 2 is kind of close, I will admit. But... Mm -hmm. It's a case where, again, those games are mm -hmm. so detailed that they're mm -hmm. not really meant to be super accessible. So the AAA industry just simply ignores them entirely. Yeah. I mean, you, you are correct in identifying um, sort of uh, uh, one of the key um, decisions that game developers have to make is... Um, what is the right level of ac accessibility for my game, right? And um, uh, and and simply generically imposing it upon a developer uh, could turn up to be the absolute worst thing you could do, right? And um, and I, I I do think um, when you bring up something like Steel Battalion too, right? Um, yeah, well, you know what if what if the game was nothing but that strategic campaign layer um which was you know it's a big giant map with the you know um 20 30 pieces of uh <laughs> of uh, uh you know cards representing uh, uh whole divisions uh fighting with each other like what if that was the that would be more accessible right <laughs> uh but underneath that there's this underneath that surface there's all these layers of, you know you, you, you have real Oh, you're breaking up there. You'll have to speak up. Oh, you have you have a real outstanding ba uh, battlefield game. Let me call them. And um, uh, that, um, uh, that 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 would you know if you if you impose sort of access from the outside onto that game, that would be a bad idea. Um, and and so sort of developer self determination here, I think, is a, a very important thing, right? And I would agree with you that. Um, uh, you know, you 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 can't uh, force these things uh, from the outside. You have to make them. Uh, you have to make the developer themselves uh, figure out what what the fit is, right? Um, uh, and I think uh, you know, I think the the game industry still has to uh, realize this or or get it. Uh, you kind of broke out, broke up there again. I mean, you've been breaking up a little oh, bit. I'm sorry, but oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I was saying that uh, the the game industry has to get this level of accessibility right, and it should be determined by the game developer. Right. I actually completely agree with you on this. It's actually one of the big reasons why I've been interested in looking at the sort of stuff that is in the indie market because they don't have they don't. While they don't mm -hmm. have the monetary resources of a AAA publisher, they at the same mm -hmm. time don't have the same sort of restraints. And as a result, we yeah. see games like Kenshi being made by just one man. 
And it, mm-hmm. it it actually came out around the same time as Fallout 76. Now, granted, Fallout 76 isn't mm-hmm. exactly a really good game, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. the point is, it came out, it's about priced about 30 bucks, and it's despite being a PC exclusive and being made by one man, it's easily the better game of the two. That's mm-hmm. despite also being a post-apocalyptic, old-school mm-hmm. style of um, mm-hmm. top-down CRPG. Mm-hmm. Really interesting game, by the way. If you want to try it, it's got. I think mm-hmm. you, you'd genuinely like it. Um, mm-hmm. A game I've been actually. Com- I think we're about done because it's been just over an hour, but yeah. There is a game I to give another example before I go. Uh, I've been really looking forward to it, but at the same time, I've been worried about. I've actually been worried about how the journalist community will take to things when they realize that it's going to be coming out this year. Because I, I given the subject matter of the game, I wouldn't be surprised if there are a few hit pieces written on it. Uh, mm-hmm. But the game is titled uh, "Ready or Not." Now, if you want, I can pull up a trailer for you. Uh, I can do that. That's right. Yeah, look up "Ready or Not" trailer, and it should give you an example. Now, the game it's it's got some pretty dark themes in it, it because you play as a SWAT officer in a very in a rather dystopian take on the U.S. That's the the game developer's own uh, interpretation, and I think that's it's fair for them to do that. It's basically from what I've seen and from what I've played from the alpha build. I can't really mm. save too much because there is an NDA, but I will say I've really enjoyed it. And the same person that worked on it did work on one of the same people did work on a mod for SWAT four called SWAT four elite force. Mm. And I, well, well, yeah, it's, I definitely do want to see where this game goes. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, what, what do you think? What, what is your concern about what happened here? Like, uh, would I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there were a number of hit pieces um, criticizing the game for letting the player play as a police officer, even though that's the whole point of the game, because there does seem to be some animosity there, which, fair enough, some of it is definitely warranted, I think. But there's also, but it's kind of gone to such an extreme that's kind of, un, that, I, that you can't really justify all the bad press in some cases. And mm-hmm. you certainly shouldn't really slander a game for wanting to cover that sort of thing. But it also, even from that point of view, ha- uh, the game itself can be extremely dark. The devs already know this. SWAT 4 was exceedingly dark with some of its missions. Mm-hmm. Uh, ex- uh, to the extent that it was actually somewhat... You, some of the missions are kind of infamous among the community for that exact reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, but And we're going to be seeing some of that in uh, Ready or Not obviously Mm -hmm. and i am actually looking forward to how the game actually plays and handles but -hmm. i do think it is going to be a genuinely interesting experience for players Mm -hmm. yeah interesting trailer um you know hard hard for me to tell uh it it does look good definitely looks like uh, high production value Uh, Um, you're talking about the uh trailer from 2017 uh let's see this is a March 2019 uh, trailer. Official ah, okay. gameplay trailer. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. So there's that one, and there's also the 2017 one, which, yeah, if you saw that one too, mm-hmm. you'd know exactly what I was talking about. Ah, uh-huh. yeah. Um, anyways, mm-hmm. we've been yeah. at this for an hour and seven minutes now. Um, yeah. So I've run yeah, a little I, over. I, you know, I think, I think we, we at least show that we can have a conversation, right? Um, uh, and the other thing I was going to point out is that I, I do think that, um, you know, uh, AAA is one thing, but uh, the value of indies uh, is extremely important uh, to the industry. And um, uh, I, I think also this, um, this notion applies to journalism as well, right? And there's, there's mainstream journalism, there's game journalism, and there's uh, alternative journalism. Uh, which you know, I think uh, that's the boat that you fit in, right? Uh, you you're you're doing this on YouTube. Um, you're um, uh, getting your message out straight to the people, right? And um, uh, it's it's very indie in that sense. All right. Well, like I said, um, I don't want to keep you waiting too long because I only gave you a full hour's worth of time, or that's what mm-hmm. we agreed to. So. I guess we'll yep. go ahead and end it here. Uh, Mr. Takahashi, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much for the, the opportunity. Have a good one. All right. All right. Thank you.